All right, last week we learned about how we are to handle difficult people and sin in the church. And we learned that Matthew 18 tells us to go to that person, you remember? And it's always to kind of keep it down uh, on the down low. We don't want everybody to know just in case it was a misunderstanding. Can you imagine if you've been telling all these people only to find out you had the whole story wrong? So keep it on the down low. And then if it isn't a misunderstanding, still we're supposed to handle these situations with with lots and lots of love. Remember, the purpose is for reconciliation, not revenge. Amen. And now Paul turns his attention to being content with where God has you in all circumstances. And of course, I did not plan this particular study for right before Christmas, but you know what? God did. So before we get into his word, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you give us such great insight in this portion of scripture on how to be content with where you have us. Lord, we know you love us and that you only want the best for us. And sometimes the best is not giving us what we want. But you do promise to take care of all of our needs. So as we go through this amazing scripture, would you just open our eyes to see and our ears to hear exactly your heart in this situation so that we can be content no matter where we are in this life. So we love you. We thank you. We give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 says, let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. So during this time, there, the Israelites were a conquered people. Remember, the Roman Empire had come in and they had taken over just about everything back in those days. So about 50% of the people were under some kind of bondage or slavery. And Roman slavery, slavery was not based really on race because they drew all their slaves from over Europe and Mediterranean, of course, including Israel, Hispania, uh, Germany, Britannic, or Britannia, excuse me, the Balkans, Greece, and anywhere else they could conquer. And this ran from 27 BC all the way to 395 AD until the fall of the Roman Empire. And of course, it didn't make it right. God hates slavery, but that was what they did back then. They were a conquered people, and so they were taken into slavery. And so now Paul is addressing this. But first, we need to know God's heart in the subject. Exodus 21, 16 says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. So right away, we see God's heart in this. He says, don't do it. But now that it's happened, what do we do? But this isn't the only way a person could become a slave. The Levitical law actually made allowances for people who found themselves in financial difficulty. They could actually sell themselves to a person to pay off debt. And even then there was guidelines. Exodus 21.2 says, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. So with this kind of background, let's read verse 1 again. It says, let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. So what the word is saying here is that those who are in bondage to someone else, they are to be the best possible workers. Why? So that the name of God will be honored. If the master is treated with respect, then that will bring honor to God. Because that may be the only uh, picture of what Christ is like to these people. And so how can we apply this concept to today? Well, it's the employee-employer relationship. We are to be the best employee ever so that they will know that Christians are the best workers. 
even if it means that they say, I don't want you talking about Jesus while you're on company time. What we do during our breaks is our business. But if we're on his dime, we need to be the best workers. I used to uh, hang out with this gal years and years and years ago, and we'd gone to this little craft boutique and stuff and had fun. And, and we were hungry, so we'd gone through McDonald's, and, and at, it was through a drive through And she had given the, the, the gal that was uh, handing us the food a little uh, uh, tract you know, the four spiritual laws. And she made a point of saying, here, I want you to read this during your break. Notice she didn't say, I want you to take time from your, your boss's dime to read this. She says, when you have a break, I want you to read this. And I think that's the, the proper attitude, isn't it? We want to be the best workers. And then verse 2 says, And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren. So I would imagine this would be difficult for a believing slave to think respect, respectfully about a believing master. Why? Because, you know, they would want to be released from this, this servitude. But whether or not a believing master should or should not be a slave owner, um, Paul is not debating here. We already know God's heart here, and that it's wrong. Okay, so what do we do, though? This is kind of a cultural thing. These are Romans that are owning slaves. So how do you reach you know, a, a believing master? Well, still, be respectful of them. Be content. Remember, that's our theme here. Be content with where God has you. Maybe he wants you working for that believing master for a reason. We don't know because it is the will of God and we need to trust him. He understands the difficulty of the situation and he can speak into the master's heart on his own. But God does warn these guys these unbelieving, or excuse me, these believers who are slave owners. Colossians 4.1, he says, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And then Ephesians 6.9, it says, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So this is a very strong warning here to employers also. Meanwhile, why is it that the servants are to respect their believing masters? Why does he say this? And it needs to be noted here that some people have used this particular text to justify slavery. And please understand, this is, not the, this is not the case. This is not what the word was talking about. This does not condone slavery. It actually condemns it. But he's saying, OK, well, now it's happened. This is how you're supposed to act. So I hope you understand that. Then the second half of verse B says, but rather excuse me, verse 2b says, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So hopefully the believing employer is generous to give the church to the church and its people. If not, then later on in our study, we're going to address uh, those that are greedy. So... Be the best worker possible, whether your boss is a believer or not. That's what Paul is trying to tell us. That is what the word is telling us. Then verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. So what is being addressed here are those who don't want to listen to what the Lord wants. They don't want to teach the pure word. They don't want to respect their masters in this case. And that's why Paul is saying, this is why I need to remind you, you're supposed to be the best employee. You know, maybe they wanted to start a revolt, 
Perhaps they wanted to run away from the Romans. Who knows what was going on? But Paul was reminding them, we're here to save souls. I saved you. Your job is now to save others. And that could mean your, your master. The problem with what was going on is they were being insurrectionist and people were blaming Jesus for that. And he's going, oh, no, no, you got it all wrong. Yes, I came to set you free. I came to set you free from sin. And so he's saying that is the most important thing here. So the verse says so much more, though. This is a warning to anyone who does not teach the word of God and instead teach their own philosophy, their own version, version of the gospel to suit their own appetites. The words can sound religious and perhaps even Christian, but be aware of them. Colossians 2, 3, excuse me, 2, 8 says, beware lest anyone cheat you, I love that, cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Our scripture then goes on to describe these people, and it's in our homework sheets. It gets uh, pretty descriptive. It says, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. I know people like this. I've personally seen this happen. Instead of taking the word in its simplistic form, they will extrapolate it out so much that it now means something that the Lord never intended. They will argue for hours about something as simple as baptism. You know, are you really baptized if you're just sprinkled? Or do you have to be dunked? You know, people will argue over these things. I don't think God cares. And that is how the Jews ended up with all the laws that they have today. It's pretty amazing. For example, in Exodus 23, 19, it says, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. That's a weird thing for Exodus to say. Yeah. The truth is, we don't really know why God put that there, but that's not really what the problem was, since the Israelites knew exactly what they were not to do. They just the word said, don't do this, so they weren't to question it. They weren't to cook a baby goat in its mother's milk. It does sound very cruel, doesn't it? But it could have been something as simple as God didn't like it, and that's his prerogative. But while there is a problem in understanding the purpose of this passage, there is no problem in understanding the meaning. They are supposed to be set apart. They're supposed to do what the Lord says. But that being said... Today, in Israel, you cannot eat any dairy product with a meat product. They have decided that this must be what the Lord meant when he said, don't cook a goat in its mother's milk. So you can't have any beef and cheese, which means no cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> no pepperoni pizza. You can't even have cream in your coffee in the evening if meat is being served. Isn't that weird? And I found this out personally. My first trip to Israel, I learned the hard way. And um, the second night of having coffee without cream, I said, forget this. And so during breakfast, I gathered up a bunch of little creamers and put them in my purse. And then I, um, I sat down, I got my coffee, because I can't drink black coffee, and I'm dumping the creamer in there, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm so smart. About that time, one of the servants or uh, waiters came up, and he goes, ma'am, I'm going to have to take your coffee. And I'm going, what? He says, you put cream in it. I'm going, and? So come to find out, he picked it up, he poured out the coffee into a special sink, I guess that was blessed by a rabbi because I had defiled it. Then he threw the cup away. 
they're serious about this. And so, you know, I'm feeling pretty stupid about this time, but, <laughs> and it even goes farther than that. So they will have a whole set of dishes just for breakfast. They'll have a separate kitchen just for breakfast. And then they have a separate kitchen for dinner with its own set of dishes, just in case there's a little food that's left on one of the plates after it's been washed. You don't want it to mix with, you know, something like, you know, cream cheese, you know. It's, it's like, it's crazy. But you see, they thought, this was pleasing to God, when all along God is just saying, I just want you to love me. I want you to have faith in me. I don't want you to have faith in your crazy rules that you can't mix, you know, uh, beef with. It, it wasn't, and beef isn't a goat, you know, so you could see how they just went way off on this. And they've done this to many of their laws. And so, They truly believed that they were pleasing to God because they had taken these extra steps. But it's often so much more. You see, they do it for their own gain. They do it for power. They do it for wealth. Whatever reason they do the things that they do to make all these rules, it's not pleasing to God because God says, my word is simple. He made it so that we can all understand his word. It doesn't matter if you are someone who is mentally challenged to the most intelligent being on the earth. It's made so that we all understand it in its simplistic form. But these guys were making it all more difficult. They love to figure out exactly, you know, hey, let's, let's make it as difficult as possible to follow God's word. It almost seemed that way. And then verse 5 says, it goes on to say, they were useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Now, when I think of destitute, I think of like the, the desert where you can't see a plant for miles. That's destitute, isn't it? Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself. So going back to my example in Israel, did you know they have to hire a rabbi to come bless their kitchen to make sure it's kosher? And of course, they give them a lot of money for that. So it's like, okay, so they made up these rules so that people would have to pay them in order to run their kitchen. So they would have to have the blessing of the rabbi so it could be kosher. You see how, but you know, it, it, the, the, the Israelites aren't any different from us. We do the same thing. Human nature is human nature. We just do it in a different way. We do the same thing with religion, don't we? But it's useless wranglings. From such, withdraw yourself. Why? Because you know what? They can influence you very easily because their minds are corrupt. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, you see, we are not like the many hucksters, I love that word, who preach for personal profit. We, we preach the word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. So the term huckster describes a person who sells something or serves biased interest using pushy or showy tactics often used as a negative term. So if somebody calls you a huckster, they're actually insulting you, so just beware. But I'm reminded of the old-fashioned snake oil salesmen from the 1800s. You know, they were always trying to sell the hope of a cure to people who are, are sick and they're desperate, absolutely desperate desperate for a cure. Unfortunately, the supposed cure kept them from seeking out real medical care oftentimes. The same is true with these hucksters selling a false gospel, a false Christ, turning, a people, turning people away from the true Christ, the true Savior. That is why at the end of verse 5 it tells us to withdraw from such people because what they're selling is like poison. We're to, we're to keep the pure word and not go chasing after other philosophies. Verse 6 says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul now turns his attention to being content. 
If anyone knew how to be content in this world, it would be Paul. So when he says godliness with contentment is great gain, he meant it because he lived it. In writing to the Philippians, Paul told, that, told them, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have a chance to help me. Now that, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. We all love this last verse, don't we? But have you ever really looked at the application of that verse? Paul is content even in difficult circumstances. But how do we accomplish this task? It sounds really, really difficult, doesn't it? Especially in our world of extreme materialism and commercialism. I mean, we're watching commercials right now that, you know, if you, if you really loved by your husband, he will buy you a Lexus. It'll be in the driveway when you wake up on Christmas morning with a big red bow, or he'll give you, you know, this huge diamond ring, all these kind of things. I mean, they're selling this stuff to us. We're, we're feeding this into our heads, and it makes us discontent, doesn't it? It's like, oh, I want a new car. My car now smells like French fries because I'm always eating in the car. <laughs> you know, it's true. But you know, it's like I want I want my car to have that new car smell. You know, you can actually get the fresheners that smell like new car. I should get one of those just so I can deceive myself. But um, but you know, we're we're so easily tempted by these things, aren't we? But Philippians 4:19 says. And my God shall supply all your need, not wants, your needs, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And his riches are everlasting. They're not temporal. Everything decays in time. Jesus warned us in 12, excuse me, Luke 12, 15, and he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Why is that? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Amen? I read a story. There was once a rich man who was near death, he was very grieved because he had worked so hard for his money and he wanted to take it with him to heaven. So he began to pray that he might be able to take some of his wealth with him. And an angel hears his plea and appears before him. Sorry, but you can't take your wealth with you. The man implores the angel to speak to God to see if he might bend the rules. The man continues to pray that his wealth could follow him. The angel reappears and informs the man that God has decided to allow him to take one suitcase with him. Overjoyed, the man gathers his largest suitcase and fills it with pure gold bars and places it beside his bed. Soon afterward, the man dies and shows up at the gates of heaven to greet the Apostle Peter. They always greet the Apostle Peter, don't they? Seeing the suitcase, Peter says, hold on. You can't bring that in here. But the man explains to Peter that he has permission and asks him to verify his story with the Lord. Sure enough, Peter checks and comes back saying, you're right, you are allowed one carry-on bag. But, <laughs> but I'm supposed to check its contents before letting it through. Peter opens the suitcase to inspect the worldly items that the man found too precious to leave behind and exclaims, you brought pavement? So, of course, this, <laughs> you get it, streets of gold. Uh, but, of course, this is just a story that we often, but we, and we often forget that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We don't need anything here. But we have, we have brought nothing into this world, and we can certainly not take anything to heaven. So why would we want to spend time seeking after the things of this world, the materialistic things, when we are promised that he will take care of us, 
Matthew 5, 19 through 20 says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. How do we get those treasures in heaven? It's you and I. The treasures we have are the people we bring with us to heaven. See, as believers, we are not to seek after earthly treasure because they can't last. Not to mention it would be contrary to God's will for you. 1 John 2.15 through 17 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? But it's also a very strong warning, followed by the promise that if we keep our eyes focused on doing the will of God, we will have eternal things, not temporal things. And there is great blessing in doing the will of God. Verse 8 says, and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. One of my go-to verses whenever I worry about finances is found in the Gospel of Matthew. And it says, why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have such little faith? Amen. You, so don't worry about these things, saying, what will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. It really comes down to whether or not that God will keep his promise. When we're worried about what we will have or if we are going to be taken care of, we're kind of insulting God, saying, I don't believe you can take care of me, God. I know that's what I do. It takes faith in God. We must trust him at his word. And now the word draws our attention to the gathering of wealth. Verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. So what is so bad about being rich? I could show you lottery winner after lottery winner who wish they'd never bought the ticket in the first place because it did pierce them with many sorrows. I could show you billionaires who have all the money they want but are still extremely unhappy. Their kids are a mess. It's all the party atmosphere. They depend on their wealth. They worry about losing their wealth. They're extremely unhappy. For me, I just need to take, to take the word as it says for what it is. And that is truth. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. I don't want to be caught in a snare. A snare is a hidden trap an unexpected trap. It's used to trap animals. And in this case, it's used to trap us. Who puts that snare out there? Of the enemy, of course. But they fall into temptation, and there's no way out of it. Of course, God can forgive. But we will pierce ourselves with many sorrows. If you're the one that thinks that you can handle all your wealth, be careful. You may be deceiving yourselves. It's very hard to handle wealth properly. So what do you do if you happen to be rich? Please know that it is not a sin to be rich. It is simply a challenge. First and foremost, if Jesus is your Lord, then the money belongs to him. And that's what we need to understand. We are a steward only of his money, his finances, his treasures. And always remember that he gave it to you and he can take it away. 
always keep that in mind. I have been through that personally. Job was one of the few people that ever, ever recorded that had the right view of his riches. He was very rich, and the Lord allowed it to be taken. Listen to what he says in Job 121. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. And the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Really look at that. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job knew who gave him his wealth, and he knew who took his wealth, and he still said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was content. Of course, he went through a lot of difficulties. If you ever read that whole book, it's amazing. But what is being spoken here in Timothy is be careful. Be very, very careful. Why? The end of verse 9 tells us, and they, they fall, into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men or women in destruction and perdition. Well, that sounds scary, doesn't it? We all know what destruction means, but what does perdition mean? Well, a state of eternal punishment and damnation into which a sinful and unrepentant person passes after death. So what is being said here is that when you have a lot of wealth and you're an unbeliever, you depend on your wealth to save you, to get you through all the struggles in life. But what don't they have? They don't have eternal life, do they? That's why they are going to have destruction and perdition. Jesus said in Matthew 23 through 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, for all you seamstresses out there going, yeah, I would say it's hard for a camel to get through a needle. I mean, how can that possibly happen? You know, this is not to scale. So you figure, uh, <laughs> my needles are generally about that long. So what is he talking about here? Well, a needle is simply a gate. And uh, this is in Jerusalem, and it was a needle that on the wall that surrounded the old city of Jerusalem. And what the needle was for is security in the evening. They would close the main gates where all the camels and uh, the donkeys and uh, wagons, all that went through the main gate. At night, they would close the gates, and they would only leave the needle open, which was a small gate to the side. A camel cannot get through there. A horse could not get through there. It was actually pretty small. Here's one that's even smaller. So you can see there's no way a camel's going to squeeze in there. And like he's a very little camel. It might be a baby camel could get through there. But it was, it was for security. That way, somebody who was uh, outside the wall and the gates were shut, he still could get home. So why do you think Jesus would make this statement? It seems as though the bigger the camel, the harder it was to get through the needle. Perhaps the richer, the harder to, to get to heaven because you depend on your riches. You see, when you have a lot of money, you have a tendency to put your trust in the money and not in the Lord. They think that their lives are complete because they have money. They can do whatever they want. Jesus, when talking about this lifestyle, said this, what sorrow awaits you who are rich, for you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you, you are fat and prosperous now, for a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now, for your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. That's what Jesus said about it. When you're rich, this is your only happiness you will have. But someday you will die. And then what will happen? Then verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Throughout history, many heinous crimes have been committed for the sake 
of money. People tell all, so all sorts of lies for money. They will kill for money. They will rob for money. They will sell drugs to kids for money. And notice that it says all kinds of evil. It isn't the root of evil, but all kinds of evil. And it is a root not the root. So there are other ways that evil can perpetrate itself. Um, people do evil things for power, revenge, fame, you name it. You know, there's a lot of evil in the world. Then it gives a real reason, though, why you shouldn't desire to be rich in the worldly sense. At the end of verse 10, it says, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Nothing is more miserable than a Christian that has strayed from their faith. Once they have tasted how good the Lord is, everything from that point on will taste sour. It just doesn't taste the way it used to. If they make lots of money and use it for their own pleasure and not the Lord's, they are miserable. If you have given up a life of faith and now depend on your riches, you will be miserable. And I'll leave you with this, found in Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 11. For those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth? except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers. Ecclesiastes. This is in the Old Testament. That's what it means to be pierced with many sorrows. People will love you for your money and not for you. And that is not how God designed us to live. We are designed to commune with God, to trust God, to have faith in God. And that is what brings us true peace, true love, and true contentment. If you are rich, seek how to use it for God's kingdom. If you are poor, be content, for God will take care of you. That's the promise. Be thankful for wherever God has you, especially during the holidays. Don't listen to the world. That will bring discontentment. But be happy with where God has you. He knows your needs. He will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. All Heavenly Father, we admit that we are weak and sometimes we lack faith. We know in our hearts that you can take care of us, but we still worry. We worry about so many things, our finances, uh, especially our finances, but you know, our kids, you name it, Lord, we will worry about it. Help us to trust in you more, to be content wherever you have us, whether we're rich or poor, where, uh, you know, it, where we are emotionally, Lord, you understand. You understand us because you created us. We are your masterpiece. Help us to be content wherever we are. And as we divide up in our groups, Lord, I just ask that we truly are able to apply this to our lives, that we can see your word for what it is, a love letter, love letter from our Heavenly Father that wants us to trust in Him, in Him alone. So we love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.